So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base, how do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number nine. Hey folks, this is Ed Matthews with the Real Estate Underground podcast. I'm joined by my partner, Rich Brown. Say hello, Rich. Hey everyone. How's everyone doing out there? And we are really excited to have one of the OGs of CT RIA, Linda Baumgarten. Linda, welcome back. And uh, we're really excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Sure. Anytime I can hang out with CT RIA is a good day for me. All right. <laughs> So a lot of the folks that are listening to this probably know exactly who you are, but there may be one or two people out there who don't know who you are. And so can you give us a little bit about your background and how we all know each other and how you got here? Sure. I started uh, CTBA some time ago with Joanne and Lou Brissett. We started it because we loved real estate. And when I realized that my tenants were becoming my best friends, I decided that maybe I should start something where I can meet some other people. So that was one of the things... I love our tenants because they pay me every month, but I sure. didn't want to hang out with them necessarily. But prior to that, I was a uh, technical writer. I worked for DuPont and Duracell and other companies like that. And then I became a really good insurance agent, sold over $3 million of insurance, one family at a time. And then I picked up the real estate bug and just really loved real estate and then really like teaching. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Yeah. And so there are a whole bunch of people I've learned from you. I know Rich went through the coaching program and he's yeah. one of the success stories, many of one of the many success stories. Yes. It's been a little while. So it's been what, three years, I think, what, yeah. since we all took over and yeah. you got to go hit golf balls with your partner and go have some yeah. fun. <laughs> and so tell us about what you've been up to and uh, what you're working on these days. So given the current phase of the market, really, we've been optimizing the properties that we have. And then we've been selling a lot of them, quite frankly, because we bought them at a good price and ran them for a bunch of years, four four or five years. I think my best ones were in 2014, 2015, and then they've really gone up a lot in price. And so we've been, yeah, uh, it was good timing. And then I've been selling them off. We've just sold our home in Connecticut, so which is bittersweet because we were living right on Long Island Sound, uh, but grandkids and mom are down south, and so that's what we're doing now. Okay. And yeah. So that, that's and then at the same time, I'm always a student, so I'm studying really hard on negotiation skills and getting ready for what we anticipate 2022 is going to be an interesting year. It's going to. We're not sure what's going to happen, but it's going to be interesting. So getting right. Uh, Indeed. The Chinese have a uh, saying, and I I actually think it's meant as an insult, but but it applies here as a positive comment. And that is, may you live in interesting times, right? And I think this is about to get very interesting. It's been very interesting for the past two years. And the other thing I want to share is that because I moved to Atlanta, where, funny story, I attended one of the RIAs there. And I stood up and I said, look, we just sold an apartment building. We have money. We're doing a 1031 exchange. I'm looking to buy property. And some lady got up kind of snotty, actually. And said, well, how do we even know you know what you're talking about? And, and so <laughs> I, I, I so laughed because nobody knew who I was there. Right. So as a result, I have a lot of advice for brand new investors because I had to start all over again with finding contractors, suppliers, right. learning right. the market, everything. I'm, I've gone back to zero. It's interesting. Right. So the transition here to down South, has it been what you expected? Is the real estate there similar to what you had in Connecticut, the experience? I mean, the really beautiful thing about New England is you have lots of two families, three families, four families, six families right. here in this area. You don't, unless you're in the hood, very few duplexes, mm. triplexes, quads, So that's really different. And with the pandemic and nobody was talking to anybody from that angle is different. And, you know, when they talk about the friendly South, I mean, Atlanta's a fun town, but there's a whole lot of Northerners down here now. So that old friendly charm I haven't seen as much as I expected to. (laughs) But we're making friends and people are getting to know each other like that. Yeah, all those Yankees are ruining it for the Southerners, right? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) That that is the point, yes. (laughs) <laughs> but you do have 
with brand new investors, it's I started off buying a three family house. I mean, my partner had already owned a three family house. That's kind of where we went into it. Whereas a lot of times you say, well, go wholesaling first, then do rehabbing, then buy a multi. Well, we started with multis right away and made money right away. And At so, first. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right on. So Linda, and before you even say anything else, Linda, I want to publicly thank you for being my coach. My experience in investing came through getting involved in CT RIA, meeting you, meeting Joanne, meeting Lou, and everything you guys did for me. I truly appreciate it. So I just wanted to say thank you. I know Ed, we're not supposed to get all mushy and everything, but you um, get as mushy you know, as you want, my friend. <laughs> but Linda was definitely, I mean, she was very patient with me. I listened to a thousand of my stupidest questions and has really, really helped kickstart me into the real estate game. So I just wanted to publicly thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I sure appreciate that's my life mission. I mean, real estate is great, but I really appreciate you saying that to me because it means a lot to me for sure. Yeah. And you, I think you're one of my best dressed students. I got to say, you're, one, <laughs> you're not going to be here right now, but you would show does up clean up nice. There's no, uh, there's no denying it. Yeah. It's funny because one of the things we talk about all the time is the freedom that real estate gives you, right? And when I was coming to class or I was involved as a member of CT RIA, I was always in my suit, always coming from work. The thing about it, and my wife actually laughs at me now, she's like, when I met you, you were so well-dressed. And today, all you ever wear is T-shirts and jeans or T-shirts and shorts. Yeah. And it's one of the beauties of being in real estate, right? Right. Yeah. Like you have a whole lot more freedom once you hit your number and you can do the things that you want to do in the way you want to do them. It allows you that freedom and I'm enjoying it. So yes, I am definitely in t-shirts and shorts a lot. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. It's when I left corporate America back in 18, I had, I don't know, a bunch of suits in my closet. I now have two suits, a black one and a blue one, one for weddings, one for funerals. That's it. Yes. Right. And <laughs> you know, it's wonderful. And I got, I got a phone call a while back from an old boss of mine. He's like, any chance you're interested in coming back and working in technology? And my answer was, as I swallowed my laughter, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So yeah, it, it certainly buys you time, the freedom of time, and you know, obviously financial freedom as well. So People ask me why real estate, and it was always, uh, family is super important to me. So I yeah. wanted to be able to have the freedom just to be anywhere I wanted to be, all of my family was living far apart from where I was living in Connecticut. And I wanted to be able to take a vacation when I wanted to take a vacation. And absolutely, so that was a, a big thing. And now with my mother's health and the way the health has gone over the past four or five years, just being able to do that. And she's asked me all the time, well, don't you have to go to work? And I said, well, my work is right here. They still deposit checks into my bank account. I really right. don't have to go anywhere. So like you said, the freedom is truly amazing for sure. Once you get going, but you just have to get going. So Rich is one of the success stories and one of the many people of, in your legacy of having founded and run CT RIA so well for all those years. And so I'm curious, you know, you've met a lot of people over the years, thousands, I assume. What do you see separates the folks that are successful versus the ones that never really get over the hump of dreaming about it and living the life we're talking about here. Exactly. Well, you know, there's a cliche, but it's true. Like the best baseball players swing the bat all the time, but they only hit the ball 30% of the time. Right. And the ones that are successful are the ones who take action. And it's as simple as that. I see so many people that spend all their time spending lots of money on their entities, should it be an LLC or subchapter S or any of that, when they read all these books or they don't read the books, but they never take any action. So you have to right. be willing to make mistakes. And having a mentor is so important because they'll help you get out of the mess if there is one, but really just taking action, just get out there. And the people that get out there and talk to people and talk to realtors and bankers and network with people, contractors, they're the ones who end up being successful. And it's Couldn't helpful that more. I'm a school smart person. You know, I was a straight A student, not so much a street smart person. And those You're are two. pretty savvy. <laughs> well, now I am, but you know, there's kind of like two types of people and I've had to learn both. And I remember Robert Kiyosaki saying one time, he said, 
when we were in school, we were penalized for cheating or collaborating. But as business right. people, we get reimbursed for collaborating. So the more working I do, the more collaborating, more success. Yeah, absolutely. And so action is clearly a key to success. Rich and I were talking about a project we're doing here in, at CT Rhea, and he, was, he reminded me of something that I've always tried to live by, and that is don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yep. you don't have to know everything. You just have to know enough to be able to put yourself in a position and act. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, Dan Kennedy, he's got a lot of books yeah. he's on, on marketing. Sure that you really know. And Dan Kennedy said, good is good enough. You just got to get Absolutely. it. Out, right. And especially in our society today where things are changing so fast all the time. If you don't put it out there, nobody's going to know that you exist. Right. So. Right. And then I think Think and Grow Rich Ford mm-hmm. was questioned and made fun of. And he said, look, I don't have to know all the answers. I just have to know which button to push to call the right person to give me the right advice. And I still do, that. still do that. I don't know how to fix this thing. I don't, I need a contractor here. I don't know how to, you know, whatever, just be willing to ask questions. And I think, absolutely. I think and women, delegate. yeah, women, I think we have it easier because we're, especially in construction. Like I think guys are expected to know construction. I don't know why, but there's kind of like a manly thing to do. And as women, not, I play the dumb blonde a lot. I said, you know, I, I don't really know. Can you tell me? Can you help me? And so I find out a lot. And then I also can find out if the other person knows what they're talking about, because I probably already know what they're talking, you know, what I'm asking. Yeah, you've probably forgotten more than they know. Yeah, probably. Yeah, right. probably. You've been doing this for a little while, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish more people would ask, especially in this economy, just to get serious for a second, there's a lot of people right now that have not been paying their mortgage, haven't been paying their rent. They're about to have a big comeuppance and yeah. stuff is going to happen. And now's the time to really ask, like, how do I get out of this mess? Don't be embarrassed about it. Just raise your hand, ask the question and be willing to follow the advice. I think that's going to help a lot of people. And then as you and I, as investors, we can really help a whole lot of people get out of a mess and still make a very nice profit while we're at it. It's funny that you say that, Linda. I remember one of the things you always talked about was being ready to take advantage of an opportunity, being prepared. Talk a little bit more about that, whether it's through the coaching that you do or have done in the past. What are the things, the basic things you think people should do to get prepared as an investor? Well, number one, go to CT Rhea, show up at every event. I'm serious. Show up at every event, bring business cards, get business cards, ask questions, network as much as possible. I still think of two students in particular. They're always networking, always finding it, and they're doing really well. So doing that, read as many books as possible, get on the podcast, but know who you're. Don't do the fly by night thing. Don't think you're going to be a millionaire tomorrow. You will be one, but you've got to work on it. And then you could do things like, I always wish I knew more about construction. You know, if I had done Habitat for Humanity and been, I know somebody who, she went to Habitat for Humanity like once a month and built houses with them, but now she knows how to do all that stuff. You could do that. You could work for a property management company and learn how to do Mm -hmm. property management. I went through the whole realtors classes. I never got licensed because I didn't want a license, but at least I knew what they taught and what the laws are. So Mm -hmm. those kinds of classrooms are great. Also learning about appraisals are great. And then when somebody comes to appraise your building, when they come to inspect the building, follow along, ask questions, have them point things out. And people do Mm want to share information. So, and I would just get ready to get ready. Look, there are still really good deals out there right now. They're harder to find, but they're there and they are there to be created. The more you know how to negotiate, the more likely you're going to be getting deals. Right right now, I was negotiating on a condo and it went from $89,000 down to $71,000 just because I asked. That's $18,000. Oh, wow. And I'm still working to get it down further. So right. you just got to ask. And then I'm in a mastermind with some other people and they're buying at nine cap, 10 cap, 11 caps. So they're there. You just have to be willing to negotiate and don't be afraid. And take what the market gives you, right? I mean, in some markets, rehabbing, flipping is where the opportunity lies. And there's their, you know, multifamily is alive and well, and you're still able to buy it at a cap rate that makes sense for cash flow, right? We were talking before we started the recording here that because the market is, we expect a big change in the market, that you do want to get in and get out as quickly as possible. I don't think now is the time to do a gut rehab. 
In fact, there's a show on TV called No Demo Reno, which I think is cool. Like she does not tear down walls. So I think that is, that's why condos, I teach a lot about how to invest in condominiums. The advantage there is you can get in and out really quickly. So, and then rental market is going to get super strong. Unfortunately, there are going to be some people that are losing their homes and they're moving out there. I also think the tax code no longer rewards you for having a mortgage as much as it used to. So I think that's pushing more and more people to be renters. So if you are the one that has the tenants, and like this summer, I was trying to find a place for a tenant of mine so that I could sell our house. It took me two months to find something for him. There were like no vacancies, period. Yeah. Uh, wow. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the inventory you know, is, is pretty low. tight. Yeah. And I think there's new opportunities with the short-term rental situation. People are getting Airbnb, but also like traveling nurses, traveling medical mm-hmm. people, contractors. That's an interesting opportunity also. So I think there's things like that. I think there's room to the affordable housing. I think there's room for all of that. So whatever you're into, you can make money on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So Linda, you have given advice and mentored Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Yeah. So who were your mentors and what was the best advice you ever got? A lot of it. So Joanne and Lou, they taught me, no one cares about your money more than you do. And that mm-hmm. was really important because I yeah. tend to be yeah. the person that lends money to people or, but nobody cares about your money more than you do. So you really have to take care of it and watch it and be careful about it. So that was the biggest thing, I think. Mm-hmm. And then creative financing, learning how to think outside of the norm and be able to create a transaction rather than depending on the price. So those two things. I've learned from everybody in the field. I'm an equal opportunity student. I've invested a whole lot of money in my training and education because I, I mean, there was one guy who came to CT Ria and he said one phrase in the whole day of a seminar. And that one phrase changed my life. It meant that I could close deals where I wasn't closing them before. You never know. Somebody's going to say something that's all of a sudden light bulb's going to go off. So, that- so what was that thing that that person I was going to say, I was just going to yeah. say, Linda, you can't, I, I was like, come on, off. give it up, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the big challenges with wholesaling, and if you don't know what wholesaling is, you're putting something under contract and then you're assigning that contract to somebody else. And that's, so that's one concept. The second thing is when you're getting a short sale on a property, so you're negotiating with the bank, you pay less than what is owed to the bank. You've got to put a name on there somehow, but you want the freedom to be able to close in any other entity. So you may want to close, like say I put it under contract, but Rich really wants to buy it. I'll assign the contract to Rich. Or in the short sale, I may close in a different entity. So it, Basically, somewhere in there, I say a buyer can close in the entity of their choice. And that helped me on multiple short sales that I was doing. Because otherwise, if you change anything on the contract, they go all the way back and you could start the whole short sale negotiation again. But I think that's so critical. Then anyway, so buyer can close in the entity of their choice. Gives you all kinds of freedom to do that. It's better to me than saying and or signs in the residential market, because when people see and or signs, they think that you're going to wholesale it or that you're trying to pull a fast one. So I don't do that. I think in the commercial world, it's more accepted, but in residential, yeah. not so much. So, Well, there's less it. emotion in a commercial transaction, right? It's primarily totally. business. Yes. Where totally. residential, you're buying someone's baby. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm a social worker by training and yeah, those short sale negotiations are tough for me. You know, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, I get too invested in that. And the other thing to remember is that we did not cause the problem because we're always looking for somebody who needs to sell, not necessarily thinks it's a good idea. So if somebody Mm -hmm. needs to sell, you didn't create the problem that they wasted their money or they lost their job or they got sick or anything. But our job is to help them move on with their life as quickly and as painlessly as possible. Right. And make as much money as we can at the same time. Yeah. I mean, we talk about it here at my company. We're problem solvers, right? You know, our job is to understand where the person is, where the owner is, where they're trying to get and figure out a way to help them get there. Right. And sometimes that's 
buying the building. Sometimes that's referring them to somebody who's better equipped to help them. And sometimes it's shaking their hand and parting ways as friends, right? Yeah. But, uh, it, sometimes it's, it's just telling them the hard truth. Like exactly. somebody called me up and she was upset that her rent went from 400 to 450 and she has a room and she gets to share an entire house. I said, maybe it's time for you to go make more money. If you can't afford 450, that is a nice situation you have right now. Maybe it's time for you to figure out how to make more money. She didn't like that advice at all, but it's true. Right. I, yeah. I guess that's another thing that you got to tell people is it's time to get your accounting in order. Get your credit scores up. Yes, you can do creative things without using your own name and your own credit, but it's very helpful to get your credit score up, to budget your money, to get yourself organized. And there's a lot of resources out there for that. Get refinance. It's a great time to refinance your properties right now because the interest rates are so low. Don't spend it all. Equity is so high. Equity is so high. Don't go buy a new car with it. Just use the money and keep it someplace and then be ready to spend it on something that's going to make you more money. Buying investment real estate is both thrilling and sometimes stressful. Without a lending expert by your side, most investors don't stand a chance. That's where CT Rea Funding comes in. CT Rea Funding was founded by investors to help investors just like you fund their deals. Whether you're buying a single family rehab, an apartment building, or really any investment property, our team will understand your deal and help you close quickly. Go to ctreiafunding.com or call us at 860-876-0572. What I'm getting from that is, Linda, take on good debt, not things that depreciate. Exactly. Exactly. So, so Rick, say more about that. So how do you differentiate? One of the things that's really interesting, and Linda, I picked this up in class, right? One of the things that's really interesting is there's a lot of ways out there of acquiring debt, but there's a big difference between good debt and bad debt. So buying a car, for example, it's a depreciating asset. You pay 10000 a day. Tomorrow it's worth nine, and it only goes down from there. Yes. So I don't know why I gave that example, because I don't know where you're finding a car for 10000 a day. <laughs> but... <laughs> In the junkyard, but, yeah. Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is the same. Whereas if you buy a two-family building and you pay 200000 for it, and maybe you've got $100,000 worth of debt, the fact that your two tenants are servicing that debt for you, you've been able to leverage the bank's money, OPM, and buy that asset, which now produces income for you, right? Yeah. And that's good debt. That's debt where it is on your personal balance sheet. It is something that you owe, but not even talking about the fact that it's a hedge against inflation, the fact that you can write off the interest, things of that nature. Just knowing that your tenants are servicing the debt and paying it down and creating equity for you, as well as giving you some pocket change every month, mailbox money, that's a great way to use debt. Yes, absolutely. And the other piece of advice that goes right along with that is too many people want to go buy a big, big mansion right off. They get married and they want to buy a big house. My biggest advice is get a two family or a three family because you've got them there and then let your tenants pay your mortgage. And then when you're ready, now you can go buy a single family house and your tenants are now paying your mortgage. So we did that. We had a three family house and we bought it when we bought a new house and we moved out, we had $650 a month from the three family toward our mortgage. So we could get a 15 year mortgage instead of a 30 year mortgage. Nice. Then that mortgage got paid down so quickly. We took a line of credit out and then we were able to buy a condo with cash from the bank. Mm. So be patient. It, it be patient and you'll be so much smarter and so much better off than all your other friends. So, and I've had great advice. Of- I've had lots of students do that, and it really prevents them. The difference is critical to get on my soapbox. Is the difference is critical. So when I was much younger, I was with someone who had a two-family house. She decided to quit her business in the middle of everything and try something new, meaning she made no money. But fortunately, her tenant paid enough in rent to pay her mortgage. Otherwise, she'd be out on the street. Now, I have a friend of mine who used to make a lot of money in Boston as an architect, then he was disabled and he made no money and he ended up being homeless for three years. He was mm. homeless. If you have a two wow. family house, three family house, and you will never be homeless. 
And I've had multiple students do that. And it, it, it makes all the difference in the world. It really does. Wow. Powerful story. Yeah. Not to get too serious. On things. No, it's, but it's a reality. And, and in fact, I think it's a reality that people are staring at right now, right? Between yes. eviction moratoriums finally running out, between that and mortgage forbearances, as well as folks being way behind on their mortgage payments. We're about to see a sizable wave of evictions, foreclosures, bankruptcies, and the folks that have created their lifeboat, rental property, for instance, it may be a bumpy ride, but they're going to be okay, right? The folks that don't have those lifeboats, they're going to struggle. There's 48 million pre-foreclosures right now, 10 times more than back in 2008. And a major bank is in the middle of hiring a thousand loss mitigators. And a loss mitigator right. negotiates the debt. A thousand loss mitigators. Yeah. At the same time, it becomes really important that you go to CTRIA and learn how to screen tenants and how to buy the properties at the right price so that if you do have a vacancy, you're going to be okay. And that you're bringing in tenants that have the wherewithal to pay your rent every month because it's been very interesting lately. So getting these skills are going to really help you be successful in this business. Yeah. And the idea of cash flow is critical to success, right? It's something that I know I buy into. Rich, you and I have talked about it quite a bit. And Linda, I mean, you're a mentor of mine. I know you've been in my ear about it as well. So fact is, is that properties that cash flow are especially here in Connecticut, where appreciation is sometimes hard to come by. Cash flow is certainly a focus if you are going to get serious about buying rental properties. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah. yeah well, you also have depreciation. The tax code is Amen. still in our favor. 29 and a half years of depreciation. Sometimes you can get it accelerated. So you could break even and still save a lot of money on your tax payment every year. And yeah. in Connecticut, that's huge for sure. Yeah. Uh, don't be afraid to appeal your tax bill. It's usually January or February in your town. Don't be afraid to fill out the paperwork and go in and say, you know what, this is not worth what you think it's worth. And don't be in a rush to buy. Yes, we want to buy. And I, I feel weird about that, but just make sure it's a really good deal. And so the one that I'm looking at right now, the condo, I actually went back a year to see what it was selling for a year ago. And then I would even go back a couple of years to see what it was selling for. Because when the decrease happens, I think it'll go back down to that number. So that's kind of hedging your bets a little bit also. And hmm. the nice thing about condos, if you really love rehabbing and design, the nice thing about condos is you only have to do the interior. You don't have to worry about the roof or the windows or the front and back doors, all that expensive stuff. I met a woman. She has crews of people. She does one of these condos or townhomes every single week. She's in for five days and she's out which is incredible. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I wish I could do that. But anyway, but it, the possibility is definitely there, right? So. It's a well-oiled machine she's got. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yep. I wish my guys moved that fast. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Especially, yeah, trying to get people to show up for work is a challenge. And exactly. you know, the days of knocking down walls and all that with the cost of materials, like I'm not sure you want to do that. You want to negotiate everything, every single material, tile. Down here, we found a liquidator company. They sell everything for 50% off. So uh, we bought a lot of stuff there. And then we got referrals for the contractors there. So they referred us to contractors that were really good, a lot less than anybody else. That was very helpful. I know in Connecticut, Massachusetts, there's some of these warehouses. You want to take advantage of that. And there's Habitat for Humanity Restore. There's a lot of people that are tearing out perfectly good cabinets. In fact, we did that in our own condo that we were just finished for ourselves. We took out all the cabinets and we put it on next door and we said, you can take the cabinets for free. They're perfectly fine. We don't want them anymore, but you have to remove them. So that saved us on dumpster fees and hiring somebody to do it. And he did really well. He took them all and put them into, I think, Section 8 housing. So look for those kinds of deals too. That you, you bet. One man's treasure is another man's garbage or whatever. But I would be, say, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I had one student and she was replacing all the cabinets and she went to every single, all the different lows, I think, across the state. And she was able mm -hmm. to assemble a whole collection of cabinets. They were all closeouts. So she had to go to a bunch of different stores, but she picked them up for 10 cents on the dollar. 
So those kinds of tricks can make the difference between making money or not. And so you want to get smart about that too. You bet. So Linda, you are a wealth of information and you've got a wide, a very broad experience, you know, life experience, right? You know, you've, yeah. you were in insurance, you were a social worker, you ran a membership organization at CT RIA, you're a real estate entrepreneur. There's probably 50 other things you're not even telling us you're doing. My grandfather used to say, always present a moving target and you are the living epitome of that advice, right? Yeah. So I'm curious, what drew you to real estate? What got you into real estate and entrepreneurship? You know, that's a great question. I tell a story about when I was a kid at Halloween, we used to collect for UNICEF and we would go to different neighborhoods and I would always pick the nicest neighborhoods so I could see what they look like. When I was at Temple University, I studied social work and I had one back then they were doing a lot of eminent domain and displacing, breaking up neighborhoods. And my internship was helping those people. And I just always thought there's gotta be a way to improve these neighborhoods. I I don't know. And then I attended a seminar on real estate. It was intriguing. I thought I could make money. I don't know why real estate in particular, but it just did. But I really like that. I, like insurance, you work once and you get paid month in and month out. I like that yeah. a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And I like the depreciation to save me money on my taxes. I think those are the two biggest things that really motivated me to do it. Okay. You mentioned Robert Kiyosaki and and Napoleon Hill. In terms of your own education, what are some of your favorite real estate books? As far as real estate books themselves, Robert Kiyosaki was really the one who, and I thinking back, he really is the one that taught me about real estate. And I think a lot of people also, and he's the first one that I heard about 1031 exchanges. And what the heck is that? I like his book called Cashflow Quadrant. I like that one the best. It talks about four different types of a business. And it talks about being a business owner instead of working for the business. Because I sold insurance to self-employed people and self-employed people are basically, they have a job and instead of one boss, they have multiple, all their customers are bosses, but they're still exchanging time for money. So when you're not you know, a business owner, then other people are working for you. So I like that. In business, I learned a lot from Brian Tracy, Brian Tracy taught me how to sell. I was a terrible salesperson. And then I went from not knowing how to sell anything to being in the top five of my insurance company. So Brian Tracy, anything he does, I learned. There's a lot about sales and business and all that. And then I also like David Allen. He has a book called Getting Things Done. And the nice thing about that book is he's not telling you to do a to-do list. He's saying know what you need to do, and then do it when the time is right to do it. And it helps organize time. It's just different. I really liked him. As far as teachers and all that, I mean, you just look through the, all the speakers at CT Re, I've learned from all of them. And there's multiples, and they all have different aspects to things. Mm-hmm. The one thing I will say that sometimes people coming to meeting after meeting, sometimes they get exposed to too many different strategies and then they don't know how to focus and they go to the next shiny penny. I must say I was like that. But see, when I started, there was no CT RIA and also there was no coaching program locally that I could do. So I was trying to get a bachelor degree in real estate investing. So the nice thing is that throughout the year, you get exposed to all these different topics. Then you do one or two strategies that you know really well and make money. Just make money on everything, single strategy you do invest whatever program you're involved with, implement it and do something and make money. And then, (laughs) but if you can have a mentor or a coach, I think that is the fastest way to make money because you have somebody with experience that you can ask questions of and say, what do I do now, folks? I think that's the best thing. And then all those systems are designed to save you time. I have a program on investing in condominiums and I've learned all the mistakes. I've made all the mistakes. I have all the checklists. I have all the spreadsheets. I have the stories to share and ideas to do. And it's all in one place and you can learn it. And then when that opportunity shows up, you can do it again. So it's the same thing with every teacher or trainer that people get exposed to at CT RIA. So that's what I would say there. Excellent. And by the way, I have two books yeah. on Amazon. So I would love for people to get them. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They are called Why Women Are Simply Better. It's a little sexist, but men do read them. But they're really about being an entrepreneur and then all the steps to being a real estate investor. So those are my favorite books also. 
Excellent. Well, awesome. I, you know, and the title is apropos because it has the added benefit of actually being true. I'm married and I have two daughters. And so I, and both my dogs are female dogs. I live in a house of women and I can assure you, I am the least competent of everybody in that house. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but yes, you know, the whole point is we all have our own life experiences and cultural experiences. And we all come to this point and we have a lifetime of experiences, take those experiences and apply them and transfer them into the real estate world. And you'd be surprised at how much you have that you, that is transferable use that information. And then if you have a particular nationality or a particular ethnic background or a particular religion, whatever you have, that's a whole new network of people to invest with and to negotiate with mm -hmm. and to find out about business and real estate opportunities that quote unquote outsiders are never going to know about. So right. whatever you think is a weakness, you transform that into your strength. Awesome. Linda, I have to tell you, this has been awful inspirational. You are fantastic on the podcast. You were fantastic in person as my coach, but now, I mean, you're just killing it today. Thank you so much for this wonderful information. And, you're welcome. And let me ask, we know you about your books. Is there anything else you'd like to share with people, how they can get in touch with you? Where can they find you? Where sure. can they be inspired about doing condos? The whole thing. Sure. Well, you can find out more information about condos at a website called makebigprofitswithcondos.com. And you can do that. And I do have a fun email address called lindalovesboating at gmail.com. But it, use the local resources at CTRIA and they all know how to get a hold of me. I definitely would do that for sure. And, yeah, and, then we'll, and we'll put your contact info in the show notes as well. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So it is strange, I must say going from an environment where everybody knows you and you show up two, three, right. four times a month and you're in front of all these people and then nothing. So I love it when people call me, quite frankly, right now is a good time. <laughs> I have time on my hands. A year from now, maybe not so much, but it's been really fun. And I just, I'm thrilled that you guys have taken on CT Rhea. You stood on the shoulders of what we created and you get to the next level. Really thrilled about that. Yeah. And Linda, I have to thank you first off the opportunity to stand on your shoulders. And also you are a good friend and a tremendous mentor to me and, and the rest of us here. And we're certainly grateful for everything you've done for us. Well, thanks. This has been really a lot of fun. Thank you, Linda. This has been the Real Estate Underground podcast, a CT RIA presentation. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. If there's a specific topic you want us to cover, post it in the comments. For more information on the Real Estate Underground Podcast or CT RIA, go to realestateundergroundpodcast.com or ctria.com. Until next time, happy investing.